Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Let's have some energy. This is going to be a long day and a long night, and it's going to be a great weekend. Uh, how many people were here yesterday? Awesome. You guys came back. We must have done something right. This is our fifth time. How many, how many people are here the first time? Wow, great. All right, somebody tell me, where did you hear about this? Okay. Okay. Somebody else? Who's new? I triple E, great. Um, I, I heard I was on the news last night, too. Um, actually, I, actually, I saw some white haired guy on the TV. I don't know what they have. Uh, Nick, you know, what is that? TV Land, right? The old shows in black and white. Um, Archer, yeah, that's, that's right. That's, that's what I like to think of myself. So uh, I want to introduce our, our first keynote speaker. I want to welcome you here um, and uh, give a little housekeeping. So uh, we'll, we'll have probably over 300 people in the building because we have the parents with the kids. Um, kids program is next door. If you do not have a kid with you, uh, you can't go in there unless you're a volunteer. Everybody should have signed a waiver downstairs. If you're a speaker and you didn't get your shirt and your challenge coin and your badge or any of that, we can get that to you. Just let me know. Um, we'll take care of that. Our first, uh, uh, we do have the expo next door and the Hacker Village, which is filled with village people, um, like Tool. Tool is the uh, uh, lock picking organization that we work with every year. They've got a great big lock picking area. So there's some interesting things and vendors next door and some swag. We're going to have a raffle at the end of the day. There's a door prize. I've got a drone. We'll set it up here later so you can see. I've got an FPV drone here for this and for the kids. So if you didn't get your raffle ticket when you signed in, um, let somebody know. Go down to the registration desk and get one. Let's see. Uh, we have Ben Wolf here. Ben Wolf is a sci-fi fantasy uh, supernatural author. And uh, he spoke at our speaker dinner last night, great guy. He and his wife, uh, Carice, are both authors and they have a booth set up. We bought 100 books, 50 kid books, we'll tell the kids about, 50 adult books. He's gonna have book signing and then he's got more books to sell. So he's gonna be in the expo area as well. All right, I, don't, I can't think of anything else, but I come back once in a while and you know re remember something. It's part of being old. So our first speaker is Gene Spafford. I've known Gene for several years. Um, Gene has been in the industry for a long time, better known as Spaff, and uh, he's a professor at Purdue. And uh, he's done many things over many years, and he hasn't been convicted for any of them. And so he's going to be speaking today on rethinking cybersecurity. So Spaff, come on down. Thanks, John. Good morning, everyone. Uh, wow, that's loud. Uh, so, um, one suggestion for any of you who are going to be listening to speakers, make sure your phones are on mute. That would be the polite thing to do. And uh, also, let me, let me just note, having run various events, uh, it may seem smooth, but it's really difficult and a lot of work. So, when you see any of the people here who help organize this, say, say a thank you to them. Um, this presentation is based on my work in the field of security, which is, extends back about 40 years. And the, one of the last times I gave this was to the leadership of the National Security Agency. So you're getting, uh, you're getting an interesting presentation. Well, at least I hope it's interesting. We'll, we'll see how, how it goes. Um, I am with Purdue University. I've been there 33 years. I started the security center there. If any of you are interested in issues of higher education, getting a degree in security, or maybe you have children or grandchildren or neighbors or whatever, I'll be around and I'll be happy to talk about that today uh, with any of you one-on-one -on -one or anything else they want to talk about. So let's start security. Um, you know, this is presumably part of what CornCon is about, is talking about particularly cybersecurity. And so, if we're going to talk about a computer system being secure, what does that really mean? Um, or if we talk about security features that we want to protect or enhance, um, what do we mean? All right, so we'll start with a working kind of definition. 
and will say, and, and I think most people would kind of agree with this, um, that a system is secure if it's protected against every kind of threat. Right? So if you've got a system and there's some threat out there that somebody tries to exercise against your system and you stop it, your system is secure. Right? Does, it, does anybody think that sounds like a bad, bad way of representing it? So we'll go with that. Whoops. So, yes. So we'll start and we'll say, okay, your average computer system, if you set the controls right, you're up to date on patches and you choose good passwords and you do other things you're supposed to, how are we secure against random hackers? Probably. And I can't say that 100%, but probably. We've gotten to the point where those of us who've had some security training and background can keep out random hackers. How about malware? Things like computer viruses and ransomware? Probably. If we don't have people clicking on links in email, phishing, or visiting some suspect sites to download things, we can probably keep out the malware. Nation state hackers. Okay, so these are people who are employed, trained, funded by national governments. Um, notable North Korea, Iran, Russia, China. Um, probably nobody in this room could keep them out if they targeted you. Uh, it is a very difficult thing to do because they have a lot of tools and knowledge and, and a lot of time on their hands. UFO invasion? Probably not. If any of you here are confident you can repel one, please let me know. Um, the only person I know so far is Jeff Goldblum with a Mac. Uh, but that was a few years ago. So, um, no, you know, we, we probably can't uh, secure our systems against that. An, ex an extinction event meteor impact. No. No. Um, probably not. Uh, that, that would be a very bad day for computers as well as uh, pretty much everything else. Well, so for that meteor impact, uh, there are some things we could do. So for instance, let's push forward and establish colonies on Mars and we'll put backups of all our, our data and our computers at Mars. Um, there may be a little delay in updating back and forth, but um, you know that would protect against a meteor impact or a UFO invasion of Earth, right? Except eventually the heat death of the sun will cause it to expand, its corona will envelop the inner planets, and again, very bad day for Mars as well as for uh, the U.S. Actually, very bad millennia for Mars and the U.S. or and the, and the, and the Earth. So, um, no. Now we can't protect against that either. Um, and this shows a fundamental truth of security that is not well understood by people who don't study it very well, or very much, is that security really is an unachievable uh, goal. You cannot fully secure any system against all threats. It is, in fact, an economic endeavor. The idea is, how much are we willing to spend to stop whatever threats we can anticipate? At a certain point, we simply say we have no more budget. Sometimes we simply say we have no more imagination. But, but usually it's we have no more budget. And, and we can't do any more to protect the system. So understanding that, really goes to the heart a lot of a lot of how we actually do design and practice cybersecurity. Um, interestingly, a fellow by the name of Robert Courtney, and, and I ask this in every audience, this, I expect it less here, anybody ever heard of Robert Courtney? Okay, even in places like the National Security Agency, uh, the National Science Foundation, when I ask this, I get it most one hand up. Robert Courtney was one of the first cybersecurity specialists. He won national awards. He was in charge of security for IBM when IBM was the computer company. 
And he articulated these three laws. Um, can I get you to turn the volume down just a little? Sure. Um, so the first law is that nothing useful about security can be determined outside of a context in which it's used. And that really makes a lot of sense. Because if we're going to talk about the security of a system on board uh, the latest aircraft carrier versus a computer that's in your kitchen, the threats are a little different, the usage, the training. And so if we're going to talk about security, we really need to know something about that environment. The second uh, law of his is never spend more mitigating, stopping a risk, than tolerating it would cost you. Um, this is why we do things like make backups. Uh, because we could certainly put a whole lot of protections around our systems, but usually it, it really is just cheaper for the very rare occasion where something goes wrong to just restore from backup. And we do the same thing with uninterruptible power systems and hot spares and a whole bunch of other things. That's a very uh, important concept. And then the last one is particularly important for all the people who are really into the technology. Cybersecurity is not simply technology. It is people, it is laws, it is policies. There are management solutions to technical problems, but there are no technical solutions to management problems. And younger people tend to not understand this as well as those of us who've been around in various hierarchies for a while. Uh, management can make some really dumb decisions that we simply can't carry out. We can't possibly solve with technology. So when you think about cybersecurity, you have to think of it as a systems property. All right, so I'm going to make another approach at defining security, and I'm going to actually go back to work that was done, scientific work, that was done in the 1980s um, and late 1970s about how to define security, just to give you an idea of some history because a lot of people who work in security don't realize some of the security. Basically, for an awful lot of people, if research was done before Google was invented, it doesn't exist. And that's not true, that's particularly in this field. So let's talk about the idea of a computer running along and doing whatever it's doing. And it has memory locations, and it's got registers, simplified view. And at any instant in time, there are values in each of the memory cells and values in each of the registers. And if we were to make a long list of all those values, we could do that for every instance in time, and we could say whether or not those values made up an allowed state of the system. Is the system in a good state that we're going to allow, a secure state? because as the system progresses along, it changes state. And what we can say is if we go from one allowed state to another allowed state, that's a safe operation. The system is still secure. It's going from one good state to another good state. That seems like a really simple concept. But it also implies we have bad states. That is, there are some values that might end up in memory or in registers that violate our rules. It's a violation of our policies. It's a bad state. It's something we don't want to have happen because it's not secure. We especially don't want it to get into one of those bad states and then stay in bad states. Because that's where really bad problems occur, where values get released and, and people break in and gain administrator access and install things they shouldn't and so on. So we can define these good states and bad states. Turns out, formally, if you study in computing, these map to ideas that were developed in the 80s and are, are built now into formalisms, curricula, IEEE standards. You heard IEEE mentioned. Um, the idea of a system specification describes all the good states that a system should be in or can be in. And execution of a state that isn't in the specification is known as a fault. 
and that can result in a failure. That's when the system transits into one of those bad states and stays there. A failure in a protected system is a security failure. So we actually have a kind of a formal definition here of how a system can go from a good state to a bad state. And it depends on some underlying things like specification. And I'll get to that in a moment. Should note that we also have undefined states. Undefined states are ones that aren't really defined in the specification, but they're not really bad. They just kind of, eh. We don't really care a lot about them. They aren't specified. Um, but they could lead to a fault. I mean, it could be that the system crashes. And that may not be a security failure in some, in some cases. It's just, it's a bug. It's a problem we don't want to have happen. So those are undefined states. They're not really bad, but we may not want them to happen. Um, some of them, you know, we might temporarily go into one of those bad states and then go back into a good state. But because they're undefined, we don't know. We haven't thought about that. We don't really know what that behavior is going to be. This is what it probably really looks like for most software. Most of the time, we have no idea whether the system is operating in a good state or not. And it's in that undefined state, mostly, because the software you use today, in almost every circumstance, it has never been defined. It's never been specified. No one's ever said, this is the correct behavior, this is the incorrect behavior, and these are the things in the program that are supposed to detect and force and, and uh, work with it. There's a notion of formal specifications. That is, specifying a computer system in a logical, mathematical fashion so that we can exactly state what a good state is and exactly state what a bad state is. Uh, unfortunately, the methods we have now are sort of time consuming. They require some advanced education. Um, they require a lot of expertise to define. And then the tools to build the software from them uh, are expensive and difficult to use. But they exist. And you should be glad they exist because those are used on things like aircraft guidance systems, space launches, nuclear power plants, you know, things that might affect you a little bit if they went wrong. And so we do know how to do this, but it costs a lot extra and it's not easy to do. And it's definitely not something you're going to learn by just picking up a book and reading through it on your own to learn how to program over the weekend. Which is what happens. Right? That one on the left, you can go to the bookstore and you can buy these books. On the way here, I, I heard a, a radio ad that was saying, don't like your job? Well, you can enroll in our course and in four months enter the exciting world of IT becoming a master programmer. Four months. Working weekends. No. That is not how you learn to program well. Um, and in fact, it takes a lot of advanced study. Uh, there are people who can learn to program on their own. In fact, many of you may have done so. But that does not mean that you learned how to build safety critical or security critical systems. What happens in most companies is very similar to on the right. And I realize this is an old reference, but people here in the audience are a little bit uh, more in that realm. If you remember Jurassic Park, the eccentric uh, billionaire spent huge amounts of money to buy an island and to reverse engineer the DNA of dinosaurs and to build all kinds of dinosaurs and have them in a big amusement park on the island. And his IT support team was this one guy who ate a lot of Doritos and spilled Coke into the keyboard. <laughs> that is the way an awful lot of commercial vendors and companies currently operate. The software you buy was written by these people, these people, and not really adequately thought through for security, for safety, for reliability. 
they weren't really defined other than be the first to market so we can gain the market share. If you've, if you've heard uh, Guy Kawasaki's line, move fast and break things, that's really the idea behind a lot of startups, is just simply get the first thing out there and we'll patch it later. So pretty much everything that you, you have as software has patches issued rec regularly because they didn't really take any care to get it right the first time. In fact, this really illustrates what happens. Um, the quote on the left is one of my favorite, and again, it goes back to the 80s. A program that has not been specified cannot be incorrect, it can only be surprising. Your software is not wrong. It simply surprises you with its behavior. The fact that it discloses passwords or lets somebody else access to your data is a surprise. It was never part of the specification because the code you used was never specified. They never went through the formal process of defining what the code should do. Instead, they wrote code to go to market. And then, after people started buying it, they issued patches and came out with version 2, and then version 3, and then version 4. It started off as a laser printer, but ended up as something like this. Why? Because that's how they keep their income stream. If they sold you something that was specified and correct and didn't fail and didn't need patches, they would not make another sale to you. That really hurts the bottom line, which is what drives a lot of companies. And so they have to be continually innovating and, and releasing something that isn't well defined, isn't well specified, and generally has features that are going to cause you problems. It's the software equivalent of this. Um, when I first saw this, uh, I can't. I can't even begin to capture what I thought about this, but um, I was talking with somebody and they told me that presumably they knew, I don't know for sure, but this trouble light hanging from those wires was put there by an engineer doing debugging and discovered that whenever he took the light off the wires, the system stopped working. <laughs> and so they leave the light there simply to keep the system working because they had no way to figure out where the problem really was. I can tell you from experience and the experience of my students and my colleagues, that's the way a lot of your code works. Is stuff is in there that nobody wants to take out or tamper with. I've seen comments that say, don't change this code, we don't know what it does, but things break. <laughs> um, Yeah, it was working great until you, until you opened it with an editor. Um, that's worrisome, but that's typical. And part of this is driven by the way the market has evolved. Um, I think this is a big part of the problem. What happens is we're caught in this sunk cost loop. And if you talk to people who do management, you'll, you'll see where this comes from. But basically what happens is we had we have a hardware, right? We have a, a, a laptop, a, a PC on our desktop. We run things on it. And we add more data and we download more software and it gets slower and slower and slower. So eventually, we buy something faster. More memory, faster processor. Maybe it's got more disk or more online SSD storage or whatever it is. And now it's really fast and it's got a lot of capacity. And it turns out that there's software that we can buy for that, that the vendors anticipated we were going to buy the new system, the, the newest whatever it was. And so what they do is they produce new software for us to buy or download, which we would put on our system, because it runs on our system. It's been designed to run on the same system that we have. And we keep doing that until it gets slower and slower and we have to buy new hardware. But when we buy the new hardware, we generally end up buying the same kind of hardware that we have already because we have all this software that we have to continue to support and run. It's too expensive to switch to something else. And when we go to buy new software, we have to buy software that runs on the hardware we have. So we're stuck in this loop. We're constantly buying 
the same hardware software platform. Windows was designed in 1987. We're still using 1987 software, basically, like that laser printer with a lot of other stuff added on. We don't make innovations in better software or software design from the beginning. Everything is tacked on afterwards. I can tell you open source may be worse because we frequently, and if you look at the statistics, open source software is constantly crap having security failures and problems. And what happens to the people who are open so uh, software uh, advocates? Gosh, how could this happen when we can all look at the software, right? Many eyes make bugs shallow, supposedly. We can all see the software. How could this bug exist for the last 10 years? Somebody else says, well, let's fix it, because we're all using it. And somebody else is going, again? Um, open source isn't any better. And in some cases, it's worse. Actually, over the last decade, um, if you look at the reports of critical statistics, the Microsoft kernel is currently, by far, the most secure operating system that you can easily get your hands on um, and use. Um, uh, NetBSD is better if you're looking for something at low cost and if you're willing to pay any money. There's a company called Green Hills that makes a system called Integrity that's used in power plants and airplanes and, and so on. It costs like $600,000 a copy, um, but it's worth it if you're running a nuclear power plant or an airplane or something else. Um, so we have this problem. Again, it's hardware software. We're committed to using this software, so we're stuck with all the bugs and all the people who aren't looking for the security flaws because they're trying to figure out how to port it to their new toaster. So revisiting cyber what? What is it that we're doing? What is it that we're really concerned with? Well, if we look to the Department of Defense, which is a questionable activity for a lot of things, but this is their definition of cybersecurity. Um, prevention of damage to protection of and restoration of computers, electronic communication systems, electronic communication services, wired communication, electronic communication, including information contained therein to ensure its availability, integrity, authentication, confidentiality, and non-repudiation. Wow. The Army has just recently added to that uh, all the aspects of psychological and information warfare. It doesn't even fit on a page anymore. I don't think that's a definition that's going to help us a lot. So here are some other definitions, just to give you a sense, and I'll, I'll explain in a minute. But the first, Rob Joyce, he was the uh, presidential cybersecurity advisor for a while. Um, Cybersecurity is everything that results in protecting information and underlying technology from theft, manipulation, and disruption. Okay. I think that's a reasonably good definition. I amplify a little with a second one. Um, but, you know, that's three different... So far, I've given you five different kind of definitions. If you talk to any scholars in the field, you'll... For, if you talk to, to ten scholars in the field, you will get eleven definitions. The truth is, we do not have a formal definition of cybersecurity. There is not one that we all agree with. And that's part of the problem. This was recognized back in the 80s, and so part of the uh, terminology changed in the 80s uh, with groups talking about assurance or trusted computing. So instead of saying that we we're going to have a secure computer, we we're going to have a trusted computer. And then we said, uh, you know, we're going to assure the trust. Um, and this is close to the definition of one that I, I came up with in 1990 in one of my books with Simpson Garfinkel, which is basically a secure system is one that you can trust to do what you expect it to do. And this actually, I recently found, it is being taught in college courses as the definition of security. So maybe there is some value to that. But it's not one everybody would agree on. So trust was the next best thing that we came up with in the 1980s. 
And if you've ever heard of the Orange Book or the Rainbow Series, they were a trusted computer system evaluator, evaluation. That was where the government went in the 80s, realizing we couldn't get secure. They, they basically went through this whole exercise that I just summarized and realized we couldn't have a really secure system, so the next best was to have trusted systems. And, you know, these are all definitions of trust. I'm not going to go through it, uh, but, but they all basically say the same thing, which is that we can trust, we can put the things of value with it, and that we have reason to believe that it will be kept safe. So part of that has to do with trust alignment. Um, if you think about it, if you look at any kind of computing system, there's an employer or a company that has a set of goals and values of what they want to do. Usually those goals and values are make money. Society has goals and values, which could be protect the population, or it could be collect the taxes, or could be predict where hurricanes are going to go. I don't know. You have a set of values that government supposedly holds forth. And then you also have your individual goals and values. The ideal system to trust is one where they all align. Where my goals and values match my company's goals and values, match my society's goals and values. But that isn't what happens. We have this kind of situation where I don't really quite believe what my company is doing is ethical or right or is even a good idea. The company is doing things that they want to evade the government, um, and the government doesn't even know what they want. This is especially true with privacy. Uh, what do we do with personal information? Uh, the government doesn't really have a position, at least the US government does, the European Union does with the GDPR. Our, our employer wants to collect or companies like Amazon and Google and so on want to collect whatever information they can to market it. And as individuals, my goals and values are perhaps to limit what they can gain access to. These aren't aligned. So therefore, if we're going to build a system that's going to support trust, who's going to trust it? Whose trust model do we build to? That's not well defined. Again, we've been the field is 50 years old. We still don't know how to do these things in a, in a reliable way. We don't even know how to express them completely. And the mechanisms just don't exist to support them. And, and then there's the whole compounded trust, the levels of trust, supply chain. My system isn't all built by me. I don't build and design the silicon that goes into the system. The, the uh, computer chips, the peripherals, the wiring, as well as a lot of the software and the operating system, I've got to trust other people. Well, how do I know that they're trustworthy? What have they done to prove to me that what they built is to my level of trust? Um, it's not trust, but it's turtles. If you trust turtles, then this is a good picture. Uh, but we have this problem of composable trust, of supply chain. And this brings me to here. Lord Kelvin, scientist, 1800s, said, when you can measure what you're speaking about and express it in numbers, you know something about it. But when you cannot measure it, you cannot express it in numbers. Your knowledge is a meager and unsatisfactory kind. Maybe the beginning of knowledge, but you have scarcely in your thoughts advance to the stage of science. That has tremendous meaning for us in security because we have no metrics. The only metrics we have are dollars, gigabytes, and megahertz. Those are what we use to make decisions. Those are not security metrics. And therefore, we have a disconnect in, in how we talk about security and build systems. I mean, if we're going to build a bridge or a car or a house or anything, we have units of measure and we have devices to do the measurement. We have nothing like that in security. In fact, we don't even have things that we can talk about that we can measure. 
So if you've looked at traditional computer security courses or cybersecurity courses, they talk about this triad, this confidentiality, availability, integrity, as being the security properties. <clears throat> They're awful for a lot of reasons that I'm not going to go into here because I'm not going to turn this into an academic lecture. But I will tell you, they were designed by Bob Courtney, the person you hadn't heard about prior to this. And he designed them 20 minutes before a sales meeting. He was told that he had to tell all the IBM sales engineer about the new security features in the IBM 370. Well, he thought about it. He took a piece of transparency uh, of celluloid, which I am looking around the room. A lot of you have no idea what I'm talking about. But with a marker, he wrote on it this CIA. He drew a triangle like this with, the, with these things on it. And he presented it as the CIA model of security. And the sales engineers loved it because of the CIA bit. They got to go tell their customers that they were supporting CIA in their products. That's where it came from. It has no scientific foundation. Um, it's not a good model, because those aren't orthogonal. Um, that is, you can change one and it affects the other. They're not independent. Uh, you can disable one and, and it affects the other two. And there's, and there's no natural measure. Give me two more units of integrity. What does that mean? Have absolutely no natural measure for those. I would contend that everywhere you see in confidentiality, integrity, and availability talked about as measures, if you use rock, paper, scissors, it would be just as meaningful. Because it really doesn't mean anything. Um, how many of you ever heard of Don Parker? Okay, another pioneer in the field. And he addressed the, the triad, he came up with this hexad, as a way to add some new features, it suffers from the same problems. I'm not going to go into it. You can look it up online if you're interested in the Wikipedia uh, or otherwise. Um, it's useful to talk about systems, but it's not complete. So what do we need? Well, we need fundamental properties. Correctness is one of them. Gosh, if we could even write correct software, we'd be way ahead of the game because so many of the problems are simply from faults and problems in the software not being built correctly. Without that, it's difficult to say a whole lot of anything else. But then there are other things like simplicity, specificity, uh, limited interactions, containment, words that you may or may not have heard of if you've taken any kind of course in software engineering or security. But they're well-known uh, properties in software design. There's some other features. Um, access control, good interfaces. Oh my gosh. If you ever try and figure out how to do firewall settings or something on, on a typical system, um, you have to have a jargon dictionary and a set of charts just to figure out what the heck it is that's going on. Configuring the systems is terrible. Uh, we need to have resilient failure modes. If something breaks, the whole system just shouldn't fail. Instead, it should fall back. It's like run flat tires on your car. If you get a blowout in the tire, it doesn't mean suddenly you swerve off the side of the road. It means a light comes on in the dash, and now you've got to drive a little more slowly until you get it fixed. That's a, that's a failure-resistant kind of system, assuming you're you know, driving a, a relatively recent car. Um, I'm not sure how that works on motorcycles, but that's, that's a different kind of failure mode. Um, we need things like identification and tagging of data, uh, hardened features, good crypto, uh, auditing. And there's a whole bunch of things we need, and I'm not going to go through the whole list, but I took a bunch of slides out here because of, it was a different audience. But um, these are all research problem areas that we do not know how to solve. These are basics. In the area of security, we are at the point where civil engineers were before they had invented the right triangle. We are alchemists. We are throwing things together in systems to see if they work. But we don't know why they work, and we don't understand why they fail. We're alchemists. Or often we're janitors, because something went wrong and we've got to you know, clean up on aisle five. So I can't give you a complete list. It's a long list. Um, it's a research agenda that needs to be funded and, and, and followed. But 
too much of the money is deployed into fixing the latest problem, the latest set of buzzwords, right? We got all the money going right now into blockchain and zero trust. Wow, those are the big things. Um, blockchain is basically worthless. I'll tell you that from a scientific standpoint. It's interesting academically, but certainly don't bet any money on it. And zero trust is an idea that's been around for 30 years and used with different names, um, but they're the hot marketing terms currently. We need to do a better job of this. Um, so any of you who are interested in, in the field, in advancing the field, rather than just practicing some of the concepts, you know, there are problems here that could be solved. So let me give you a couple takeaways and finish up. Uh, I got started a little late, so I'm running a little late, and I apologize. Um, you can buy one of these things on Amazon. I think the last time I looked, the price was a little over $1,000. Um, it has every tool plus more that Wenger makes. Wenger is the company that makes these. Um, we don't call it a Swiss Army knife because no self-respecting member of the Swiss military would carry one of these. But it has pretty much everything on it. You could build a house with one of these. It has all the necessary tools. Um, you'd have to use the, the ha handle as a hammer, but every tool, saw, screwdriver, nut driver, drill, they're all there. Would you want to? Um, you could, but it probably wouldn't be very good quality, would take a long time, and you'd invent a whole lot of new curse words. <laughs> it's a problem. And yet, think about what we do in computing. C++, Windows, web browsers, Intel architectures, they do everything. That's how we build them. We do not build tools to specific purposes because the market isn't as good. Instead, we build these monstrosities that do everything but really do nothing well. And that's part of the problem as well, is we are so, so busy using these, the, building these tools that everybody can use that we don't think about are they really appropriate to use. And as a result, they have a lot of extra side effects, a lot of extra problems that occur along the, along the way because they're too big. And this goes back to Courtney's laws. Um, and really, this is an illustration. We need a management solution here. It's not, not a technical problem. It's a management problem. So it's, it's an economics problem. And we have to understand that. Um, quality first. <laughs> if there's one thing I can get across to the people who build software, it's design it, think it through, and building quality first. There are some things that simply don't patch well. Second, whatever you build is what you're stuck with. So you better be sure that what you build is what you want. And it's the special cases that will get you. 23 hours out of the day, this is a great porch to go sit on. Uh, that one hour can be traumatic, however. A lot of software is like that. If they build to the typical case and don't think about the exceptional one, you have problems. Security cannot be an add-on. It needs to be designed in. Simply throwing up a firewall or installing antivirus does not make a system secure. What would be even better if that sign said, beware of dog? <laughs> so the question I pose to you, and I pose to all my audiences is, how are we going to define security? I don't mean a definition in words, I mean a definition in practice. How are we going to build our systems to be secure? What is it we're going to measure? What is it we're going to insist is present? If we don't do a better job, then the people who buy systems, whether they're in government or companies or nonprofits, are going to have to buy on the only metrics they have available. Gigahertz, megabytes, and dollars. And none of those relate to security, and none of those relate to privacy. And that's the future. Thank you for your attention. 
Um, I think you would do for a break here if I'm reading this correctly. Oh, in five minutes. So, I have time for one or two questions, but I'll be around all day. So, any questions from anybody? Yes, sir. Can you talk about all the numbers? Yes. So, great question. I'll repeat it so the rest of you can hear this. When I say quality first, how do I reconcile that with the fact that when I said that Microsoft had the most secure kernel, at the same time, uh, when Nadella took over CEO, we basically really hindered the, the QA teams. Um, part of that is the kernel hasn't changed drastically since it was first went through the process. The QA team um, that developed the software development lifecycle built in a set of processes that are now part of development. And so there is a certain momentum going forward on the kernel. Most of the security problems with Microsoft products right now are applications. They're add-ons. They're not the kernel. And that's where part of the problem comes in is that QA team, and in fact much of the research and the security team, was done away with as a cost measure because they can measure cost. Um, and as a result, a lot of the newer products that are add-ons to Microsoft products are where the problems lie. Good question. In the back, sir. Um, years ago, back when um, XP was the latest version of, uh, you know, for, for Microsoft, you know, the latest version, uh, a company came up with a product called XP Lite. I don't know if anyone here has heard of it, but um, we used to pull all the unnecessary uh, functionality out of XP to make it a lot, uh, uh, a lot less attack surface. People use it for kiosks and whatnot, or much more stable uh, workstations. I wonder what your thoughts about the possibility of someone doing something similar for 7, 10? I'm not sure why they abandoned that. It seemed like a very good uh, uh, idea, especially for Windows, because they try to be all things all people. You have a lot of extra functionality that creates a greater attack surface. So great question. I'll repeat that. Um, when XP was, was the dominant system, and in some places still is, um, uh, Microsoft had created an XP Lite that could be used in things like kiosks and self-driven kinds of systems where they pulled out a lot of functionality and it was supposed to have a lower footprint. Um, and, and how is that as a general principle? The reason XP Lite didn't really succeed is, first of all, they didn't charge a lot less for it. Uh, and so people were looking at buying and saying, well, why should I pay 90% of the cost for 70% of the system? Uh, and, and that was part of the, part of the problem. Um, and the maintenance teams, as patches came along and as upgrades, it was unsustainable. So they just discontinued, they discontinued it. Um, you may remember Windows CE as another attempt to do something like that that also failed, except yeah, unless you're using DRE voting machines, and some of those are still running XP Lite and Windows CE, which is an abomination, and, and we should all be really upset that our government is refusing to act to secure our voting machines. However, would that be a good idea for existing systems? It is being done in some respects with some versions of Linux and Android. There are attempts to pull out subsets, some are more successful than others. Anything that's derived off of SE Linux tends to be better. Um, SE Linux was designed with some of the properties I was talking about for high assurance by a group at the NSA. Um, but it is difficult to do because as you pull some things out, other things stop working, and then you've got to make patches, and you don't know what the effect of those are. Uh, generally, building something from the bottom up works better. So Android originally was like that. That was, a, that was a, a better system until we got 8,700 different versions and everybody started adding adware and other kinds of things to it. Um, trying to build narrow systems for narrow purposes is generally a good idea. That's why airplanes don't run full Windows. In fact, they don't run Windows at all. And we have trust in them. 
Your microwave ovens up until recently did not run Linux or Windows or Android, and we had presumably trust in them that they weren't going to blow up. Uh, you can now buy refrigerators that run Linux. I kind of question why. Um, the best story I heard about that, um, just briefly, is that at a, a superstore, appliance superstore somewhere, the, the, they had very few salespeople in the store and somebody was busy helping customers. And when they came back out, they find that all of the Linux refrigerators, you know, big, bright LED screens, had all been tuned to uh, Pornhub. Uh, the shopping experience was very different, I think, for many of the customers at that place. Um, so maybe there is a use case for that on refrigerators, I don't know. Um, but uh, uh, I, am a, I am a believer that building uh, more functional, specified kind of systems for a purpose uh, is a better way, but it's more expensive. And we've all gotten used to the idea that we want everything to be cheap. It's why every drone that you buy runs, runs Android or Linux. It's because it's free. And it means that they also are all vulnerable to being taken over and damaged and so on. Um, I can take one more short question if there is one. Yes, sir. So how do I, and let me see if I repeat this correctly, um, how, do, how do we deal with systems that have uh, interacting um, requirements that interact both with the system and the applications and the, and the environments they're running? Is that a fair statement? how do we deal with that and the fact they have to interact in systems. And the way that's done is by having clearly defined interfaces so that we know exactly where the inputs and outputs go and exactly what their behavior is supposed to be so that we can reduce them to those interfaces. Um, that's not a simple thing to do. It, we know how to do it. We've, we've done it before. Uh, NASA's done it. FAA does it. DOE does it. Um, but it is difficult to do. And it gets more complicated as we add more requirements to do more things. Uh, we have this mindset that everything should be done by the processor we have on our desk. But we now can, we, I just saw an article, uh, a vendor has made a computer chip with 400,000 computing cores on it. The idea of doing time swapping, time splicing, on a system that has 400,000 cores is ridiculous. We can put a terabyte of memory on a chip. Why are we using virtual memory? I mean, there are a number of things like this that make lives more difficult because we fail to actually think, what are the requirements that we want to specify as separate? And do we, in fact, need to have those things interact the way they do? So there's some fundamental questions there that would take a much longer answer, but hopefully that gives you a hint. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. I hope you have a wonderful day. I'll be around. I'll be happy to talk to anybody about pretty much anything uh, uh, for the remainder of the day. So, have fun. <laughs>